All right, Happy New Year, everyone. In today's video, I'm going to be going through the 10 best fiction books that I read in 2022. Be sure to let me know down in the comments what your favorite reads were of the year, and if you share any with me, that would also be good to know. Also, let me know what books you're looking forward to reading next year. I might do some similar videos as well in the future, maybe looking at some of the best non-fiction books that I read, and maybe even some of my biggest reading disappointments of the year. So let me know if there's any of those kinds of videos that you want. Let me know in the comments and I will get to them. But now onto the list. First up we have The Idiot by Dostoevsky. So I read two books by Dostoevsky this year, one being The Idiot right at the beginning of the year, and one being The Brothers Karamazov at the end of the year. And I was rather disappointed by that second book, but I absolutely loved the first one. The Idiot follows a young epileptic man called Mushkin, who is a prince, and he has been away from Russia at the time of the story's beginning for a long time because he has epilepsy, and so he's been kept away in this uh, medical institution. But he returns to Russia and he comes across some of the most horrible characters you could ever wish to meet. Mushkin is very much a pure-hearted soul, he only wants to do right by everyone, even the worst kind of people, and he is surrounded by this absolute mess that we find in Russia. In fact, some of the characters that he meets are quite suspicious of him because they see his niceness as some kind of veneer and they're trying to find out who the real Mushkin is. Mushkin is probably one of my favourite characters, not just in Dostoevsky, but ever. I like how optimistic and bright he is. It's not often that you get to follow such a character in novels. Usually your characters will be kind of miserable or bleak or have something dark about them, and Mushkin really doesn't. He is kind of a bright light in a swamp of darkness, and I really like that about him. It also creates some wonderful contrast between him and the other characters, which really is the heart of this story. It's Mushkin and his relationship to these other characters. Because there isn't really all that much to the plot, aside from Mushkin just having these interactions with the characters and some things following from those interactions. The main relationships he has are with this woman called Nastasia Filipovna, I think that's how you say it, and she is a young former noble woman who has been ruined by a man who basically forced her into uh, sexual slavery. But she's liberated herself somewhat from this, but she does certainly have a reputation, and her experiences have made her incredibly volatile, and some of her big volatile moments are some of the biggest moments and the most controversial parts of the story. Mushkin feels a lot of sympathy for her, but he's also kind of scared by her as well. And she, in turn, she likes Mushkin and she respects him, but even though he would, would save her if she wanted it, she doesn't want to bring him down, and so she runs away from him. Then you have Mushkin and his relationship with Rogozhin, who is a young man who is very much the con counterpart of Mushkin. Rogozhin is not a noble, he's kind of a, mer I think he's merchant class, and he's less than savoury. And him and Mushkin have a kind of rivalry over Nastasia that goes down some very dark paths. This novel also has one of the bleakest endings that I won't spoil, but yeah, it was an ending that really stuck with me and in fact it's probably my favourite ending to a Dostoevsky novel because I do find that the epilogue in Crime and Punishment didn't really do it for me, I, I didn't think it really fit with the flow of the rest of the story, and I just didn't really rate Brothers Karamazov as much as some people seem to do. I didn't dislike it, but I didn't love it. Perhaps that's something that we can talk about in another video though. But yeah, overall, if you want a book that's just got some great characters, some great character moments and interactions and relationships, definitely recommend The Idiot. Next up we have one of two D.H. Lawrence novels that will appear on this list, and that is Sons and Lovers. This is probably of all the stories that I've read here, I read this one early on in the year, but it's one that still comes up in my mind every now and then. It's just one of those books that just stuck with me, and probably will for a long time to come. It is basically a coming-of-age story of a young man called Paul Morell, and it focuses on his family life, he belongs to a poor mining fam family, and his experiences with women, in particular his mother, and his two first loves. We have the traditional Miriam and the more modern feminist Clara Dawes. And on top of that, he's also struggling to make a career as an artist, so going against his working class background. I like that although the story is about Paul, the first part of the story focuses on Paul's mother and father and their relationship and how that sets up what will happen to Paul later. Paul's mother, Gertrude, belongs to a middle class family and she falls in love with Walter Morell, who is the minor, and it's kind of one of these kind of whirlwind romances, and it doesn't last. Gertrude ends up being resentful because she feels held back in, by a working class life, and Walter feels intimidated by this woman who is more highly educated than him, and who he sees as taking his children away from him as well. So they both kind of eventually fall out of love. And what Gertrude does is she essentially tries to live through her sons, and especially Paul, who she kind of acts like this Freudian Earth Mother Goddess to him, and it's terrifying, but also she manages to be sympathetic as well. 
you really feel for why she's doing this, but at the same time, sometimes you just want her to really get out of Paul's way. The messy family drama is really what draws me to this story. It's just a very complicated family, and what I like is that Lawrence takes the time to build up sympathy for every character. Even someone like Paul's father, Walter, could come across as just a alcoholic, minor, working class, bit of rough, and nothing else. But instead of doing that, Lawrence empathises with him a little bit. He tries to unpack why this man ends up the way that he does. You know, he spends his entire life down in the mines, risking his life, you know, seeing some horrible things down there, and he comes home and doesn't really find a loving family there when he does. And so he's driven to drink and driven to the terrible things that he does. He's still a horrible person, but you can feel for why he ends up in the way that he does, just as Gertrude ends up being a horrible person, holding her son back and interfering with his love life, but still you sympathise with her because you realise that she really has nothing else to do but to live through her sons. And so when her sons find love with other women, she's essentially losing that, that chance, that chance to be something through somebody else. I'm really glad to have Lawrence as an author of Champs because he seems to be someone who is kind of <laughs> dumped on a lot by modern critics, uh, but I find him a fantastic writer and there's lots of interesting stuff going on in his work. Moving forward in time now for the next one, we have Blood and Gold by Anne Rice. This entry in Anne Rice's Vampire Chronicles is one of, focuses on one of the most ancient vampires, Marius, and tells his story, and in particular his servitude to the king and queen of the vampires, Akasha and Enkhil. This book pretty much revitalised my interest in the series. I think it came off the back of reading the Tales of the New Vampires, which are these small kind of side novels in the series that one of them, Pandora, I didn't really like at all. The other one, Vittorio, I did like, but you know, it's kind of inconsequential as a book really. And so I was kind of getting a bit demotivated with the, with the series. So Blood and Gold really pulled me back and got my interest again. What I think Rice does really well in this book is that she combines her interesting characters and her flair for characterization with her passion for history and fuses them together so that we don't get this boring historical novel that's just a vampire story, but really an excuse to just, Frem Rice to just show off how much history she knows. Instead, we get some showing off of history, but that using, but using that history to tell a story about vampires, about characters. So this book worked really well for me. I can see why some might not like it as much because it does focus on Marius, who isn't necessarily the most engaging of Anne Rice's Vampire Chronicles. He's certainly not the start, but I find him interesting enough to carry the story. And what I also like with this book is that although Rice is retelling the history of the vampires again, she has done this a few times by this point, she still manages to find certain things that keep the story fresh, new avenues to go down, new characters to bring in, and so you don't feel like she's retreading old ground unnecessarily. It's a shame that she wouldn't continue riding this high with the crossover books with the Mayfair Witches and especially Blood Canticle, but hey ho, I did really enjoy this one. Next up we have The Divine Comedy by Dante. So The Divine Comedy is a epic poem split into three parts. We have The Inferno, The Purgatorio, and The Paradiso. And in each one of these we have the poet himself, Dante, going on a quest through hell in the Inferno, then through Purgatory in Purgatorio, and finally up through heaven in the Paradiso. And most people tend to just read the Inferno because this focuses on his journey through the various levels of hell. And I can see why that's the case because that is just a spectacle of horror and disturbing imagery and it's just such an, an engaging thing to read. Whereas as we get to the latter books, especially the Paradiso, things become more abstract, ethereal and theological. And so the book can kind of get harder to follow, harder to understand and more cerebral than the kind of guttural Inferno. That being said, I just enjoyed this entire reading experience and it will be one that I always remember. I had a really long drive, uh, it was a six hour drive, and I was going down south for a, for a job interview and I listened to the whole of the Inferno on the trip down and then on the way back up I listened to the whole of the Purgatorio and a little bit of the Paradiso. And for the entire time I was just completely spellbound by this story, especially, gonna have to admit it, uh, the Inferno because of just how dark uh, and gripping it is, but also sometimes funny. And outside of that, of course, you have Dante's companion and guide through hell and, and purgatory, Virgil, the poet. And it's one of the saddest moments <laughs> ever when he reaches the top of purgatory. You've been through this hellish journey. He's on the boundary of heaven and he has to leave Virgil behind because unfortunately, Virgil is, a, is, is not a God-believing man. He, he was existed before Christianity. And so he has to stay in hell and can never go to heaven, even though he does something very good for the angels. The fact that pagans have to stay in hell, despite the fact that they were just 
had the misfortune of being born before Jesus and Christianity came into being, is one example of Dante's uh, kind of hard line when it comes to who ends up in hell and who doesn't. But still, it's a very uh, fascinating work, and I would recommend, really, if you have only read The Inferno or you've only ever heard of The Inferno, really do read the other parts of the book as well, because it is a complete story. It has three parts, but, you know, you have to really have the three together. And when you get to the Paradiso and you're reaching those heights, it means so much more having seen where Dante has gone on this journey. It just increases the impact of the whole thing. The only thing I will say about this book is that I just wish that I could speak or read Italian at least, because I imagine this is even more amazing in the original language. Next up we have the first of two Jane Austen novels that will be on this list, Persuasion. Persuasion is a second chance romance that tells the story of Anne Elliot. She is a 27 year old woman and she was persuaded many years ago to give up on a lover, Mr Wentworth, and this was because he wasn't of the, you know, the right social class for her. And he comes back into her life at the beginning of the story and he is now a captain, a successful military man with wealth and desirable and a perfectly reasonable match for a woman of her status but he seems to be aloof and seems maybe not to love her anymore. And what we get then is the slow rekindling of possibly of their relationship, as well as some other relationship possibilities floating around as well. This is still my favourite Jane Austen novel. I really like the sombre feel of the story. It's still got Austen's wit and humour. You have her, you know, the characters that are just parodies of ridiculous people, but it just has this really mature feel to it that her other books don't. Most of her other books, they're all kind of coming of age stories. They focus on the lives of young women who are coming to, you know, coming to meet men for the first time and marrying them. Whereas in this book, we have a slightly older woman. She's not massively old, she's only 27, but in those days, that was significantly older than it means now. And she's reflecting on the past and she's thinking about the mistakes that she's made. And then she's trying to build a better future. And this makes it one of the more unique novels in Austen's catalogue and it's a shame really that she passed away and didn't get to produce any more great works because it would have been interesting to see where she would have gone in the future. I also really appreciate the themes uh, in this story. The idea of men and women and the ways in which we often don't treat each other as kindly uh, as, we, as we should. We often assume the worst of the opposite sex while assuming the best in our own sex and what we learn in Persuasion is that that isn't the right way to approach things and that when we make those assumptions things don't turn out well for us. So I really enjoy those themes and I don't think they come up often enough. And the next Jane Austen novel we have is in my opinion her most underrated novel and that is Mansfield Park. Mansfield Park is a more coming of age story. It focuses on Fanny Price, who belongs to a wealthy family, but she unfortunately is in the poor branch of it. But at the beginning of the story, she is adopted by her wealthy aunt and she goes off to Mansfield Park, where she is basically treated like a second class citizen by her family members who feel like she should always be very grateful for the opportunities that she's been offered, despite the fact that they treat her like rubbish. The only person who treats her kindly is her cousin Edmund. Then we get introduced to some new neighbours, the Crawford family, and we have the brother and sister combo of Henry and Mary Crawford, who are some of, who are probably Austin's best villains. What's so fascinating about this book to me is how ambiguous it is. With books like Pride and Prejudice and Sense and Sensibility, Austin really did have a moral message that was at the forefront, and that's kind of reflected in the titles. Whereas with Mansfield Park, she moves away from the obvious moralising and does something a bit more ambiguous. The title Mansfield Park doesn't tell us anything about what we should think, morally speaking, with respect to the story. And also Fanny is a protagonist. Yes, she's the main character, but she's also quite background. She's quite a shy person, so she doesn't engage with the story very much. And what this means is that Austin can develop her side characters, especially her villains Mary and Henry. Mary especially is a fantastic villain, and what makes her fantastic is that she says things sometimes and it's clear that we're not necessarily meant to disagree with what she's saying. And sometimes when we contrast Mary to Fanny, Fanny can come across as kind of insipid and annoying, and Mary comes across as a little bit more wise and engaging. And I think that that was deliberate by Austin. She's not interested in giving you these binary, virtuous and vicious people. She wants to recognise that yes, Fanny is vir generally virtuous, but maybe that is a flaw for her in some ways. And likewise, Mary might be vicious, but she also has some, you know, sometimes she has a point. And I like that Austin explores that in this novel, and I think it makes it one of her most morally complex novels. That being said, it is probably one of her hardest to read, and the first time I read it, I didn't really read it at all. It was only when I did it again and went through it that I started to appreciate 
those kind of moral ambiguities. So it's one that I think invites rereading, and if you've only read this one once, I'd recommend giving it a go again and having a bit of a think about it, and maybe you'll come to believe with me that it's one of her most underrated novels. The only thing I will say about this one as a negative slightly is that it doesn't have a very good romance at the end, it's just kind of contrived. But that's not really the point with this book, so I can forgive it that. Now we have something that I really wasn't expecting to like much at all, and that is the Henry VI Part 1 and Part 2 plays by William Shakespeare. Unfortunately, I haven't got round to watching the third part yet, at least not at the time of recording, so I can't include the third part. But my god, the, the first two parts of this are way better than I was anticipating. Shakespeare's history plays just have a reputation for being really boring and long, and you know, it's all about the tragedies, and it's somewhat about the comedies, but mainly the tragedies, and you don't want to deal <laughs> with the history plays because they're just dull. And so I was expecting this, and so going into it, watching them, and watching the BBC adaptations of them that they did, and I was completely blown away by how engaging the play was. I did some digging then to see, you know, why it is that at least the critics don't like them, and I found that the complaints tend to be that the plays are full of battles and fight scenes and things like that, and they're more bloody, and less focused on, you know, the erudition that makes Shakespeare such a great playwright. And I can see that to an extent, you know, especially in part two I found the battle scenes got a little bit, you know, tiresome after a while, but, you know, I still think that they're fantastic plays. Part one, you have characters like Joan of Arc, who is just an amazing character, and Talbot as well. Yes, he's a bit generic, he's just kind of a, you know, sort of good knightly type, but he's still an engaging character and I really enjoyed following him. And then in part two, you have the, especially the early parts of part two, you have this political situation with Henry VI, who is kind of insipid king, he's a bit weak, he's a bit pathetic, and so all of his you know, people surrounding him are just vying for power, and he's just stood there helplessly. Even his wife, Queen Margaret, is uh, vying for power as well, and it's an amazing, you know, it's like Game of Thrones level of uh, political intrigue. And so I really, you know, I was just engaged the whole time. The only real negative I would say is about the second part, which is when we get this Kaid rebellion that focuses on this character who just appears out of nowhere, runs around for a bit causing mischief, and then dies. <laughs> so that for me w w was a bit of a negative. But overall, I was really engaged by these plays, and my partner, who is less of a Shakespeare lover, said they actually preferred these plays to the version of Hamlet that we saw. So, <laughs> you know, swings and roundabouts. So I would definitely recommend that giving the history plays a go, if, like me, you always considered them to be dull and kept away from them for that reason, because actually, there's a lot more to them. Next up we have the most recent entry on this list, and that is Clarissa by Samuel Richardson. I've talked about Clarissa very recently on the channel, but for those of you who haven't watched that video, it is the story of a young woman, Clarissa, and she essentially has her virtue put to the test. She strikes up a friendship, sort of, with a man called Lovelace, who has a reputation for being a libertine, and her family, or brother and sister, uh, try to make out to her family that she wants to run away with this man when she doesn't, and so her family uh, then try and force her to marry someone called Mr. Soames, who she doesn't want to marry, and their response is to lock her away <laughs> and all but force her to do it, and pretty much things just go from bad to worse for Clarissa after this point. She is tricked into going away with Lovelace as an escape, and then he does terrible things to her, and ultimately she ends up in some very dark situations. This is a behemoth of a book at 1,500 pages. It took me about half the year to get through, <laughs> through it, but I was really satisfied when I finally did. The key themes in this book are obviously virtue and vice, and in particular, can someone, an evil libertine character like Lovelace, change his spots, especially if he's with coupled with a virtuous woman like Clarissa? And unfortunately, <laughs> Richard An Richardson's answer to this is no, they can't. But there is also some more subtle shifts in moral perspective. It's just that Lovelace is so terrible that he's incapable of changing. Really the driving feature though of this story are the characters. Avery character is just so well realised. Because Richardson spends, you know, 1,500 pages and the cast of characters is so small, we get their opinions on almost everything. Not just the main events of the plot, but their opinions on marriage as an institution, on men, on women, on virtue and vice, on servants and masters, on beauty, on beauty and ugliness, on inner beauty versus outer beauty. Pretty much anything is brought up in these letters between this cast of characters and it's so engaging. The only difficulty with the book is that it does take some getting into, especially the first part because there's a lot of repetition with Clarissa trying to persuade her family with very reasonable arguments why she should be allowed to not marry this man that she hates, and her family just constantly saying, you know, refusing to listen and being incredibly cruel. If you can get past the page count, you know, people do read 
very long fantasy series, so you could definitely read this. And if you compare it to those fantasy series, it's actually quite short. So I would definitely recommend giving this book a go and just being swept up in it because it was an amazing reading experience. Next up we have Mother Night by Kurt Vonnegut. So I'm slowly working my way through Vonnegut's novels. I think I read maybe one or two a year, and every time I read them it's a pleasurable experience, but I also never feel the, you know, the compulsion to, to read another one. But, but I like that, I like that he's just someone who every now and then I'm like, I should probably read another one, and I do, and I'm always impressed. But Mother Night is probably my favourite and the one that stuck with me the most. The framing device of this story is a man called Howard Campbell Jr. At the start of the novel he is in prison for war crimes. He worked as a propagandist in Nazi Germany, and he's basically writing his memoirs and reflecting on why, you know, what led him to make that decision and what happened after he made that decision. There was a lot that drew me to this story. Of course there's Vonnegut's style, and with Mother Night I feel like he really did strike the balance between this sort of sarcastic humour that he does so well, the parody, and then, but also this, this dark edge. I really did feel throughout this story just this sense of foreboding and darkness, probably because of the framing device, right? You know that this person's in prison, possibly going to be executed at the end, and so there's just constantly this dark shadow over the whole story. And also, you know a lot of times where things are going. You know which characters are going to die or what's going to happen to them because you hear about it sometimes, you know, Vonnegut sometimes spoils those events, so you just have this sense of dread throughout. But he still manages to find some of his trademark humour in there as well. I also like the way that he talks about what makes someone do something like becoming a propagandist. You know, we often like to think that they must, that person must be evil and they're, you know, a real supporter of the regime, but we learn that's not really the case with uh, Campbell. We realise that actually his reasons are kind of mundane and normal and you wonder maybe if that was you and you were in his position, maybe you would have those same mundane reasons and maybe you would do the same thing. It's a really good example of that banality of evil point, the idea that Evil is sometimes just very mundane, and the reasons that people have for doing it are not these big dramatic things that we sometimes think of. And finally, returning to D. H. Lawrence with Lady Chatterley's Lover. And again we have another class romance with a noble woman falling for a bit of rough, happens all the time, but this one is more optimistic than we got in Sons and Lovers. I guess it's because the bit of rough in this book reads books, whereas Walter from Sons and Lovers did not. Now obviously Lady Chatterley's Lover is one of those books that has a reputation, and in particular a reputation for being quite salacious. And the problem with books like this is that, you know, going into it you just have certain expectations, and this can sometimes be a good thing, you know, when something's, you know, held up as the worst novel in the world, when you read it, sometimes you, you can actually be surprised, you know, pleasantly surprised by how good it is. It's a shame that didn't happen with Blood Canticle, but there we are. And then sometimes you have a book that has really high, repu really high reputation, or in this case a scandalous one, and you read it and you're disappointed. But fortunately for me, I wasn't disappointed, and the scandalousness of it, yeah, it's, you know, it's not anything, you know, overly over the top in comparison to stuff that would come out now, um, but it still, you know, managed to surprise me in the context of the time that it was written. A second problem with scandalous books is that they rest too much sometimes on shock value, and that, well, it can be kind of entertaining to read once, it gets old and stale pretty fast. So you need to have something else going on, but thankfully it's D.H. Lawrence, so of course he has that. He harps on themes of class again. One thing that really stood out to me was this kind of metaphor that he has, where you have the aristocracy represented by Lady Chatterley's husband, who is impotent and in a wheelchair. And then of course you have Lady Chatterley's lover, who is working class, reading books, and is on the rise throughout the story, obviously because he claims the woman at the end, if you like. And so you have this kind of metaphorical rise of industry and the working classes, while the old world of aristocrats is slowly decaying. But also running through that you have another kind of problematic element, which is that while yes the working class is rising, another thing that's rising is the industrial age, and this is destroying nature. And so you have this kind of tension between on the one hand the good thing, which is you know people becoming coming out of poverty and all of that, but then you also have the, the cost of this, which is industrialization and the destruction of nature. So that's one thing that I really enjoyed about the story. But of course we do have the sexual odyssey of Lady Chatterley, and I think that Lawrence just does a great job of exploring sexuality and repression, and in particular female sexuality, which I think he does quite well because he doesn't hide away, he doesn't assume that women are, you know, ashamed of, of, of sexual desire or that they don't have sexual desire and that that's something that only belongs to men. He also explores a lot of messy complications in Lady Chatterley's relationship with her husband. After all, he is impotent, and so they actually have an arrangement whereby she can get uh, gratification from other men, and at one point he even says to her, if you want a child by another man, go for it. <laughs> um, so 
there's lots of interesting things, lots of messy things about sex and desire, and of course romance in this book as well, that goes well beyond just the, you know, the naughty four-letter words for which the book was uh, banned in many countries for a long time. I don't think I enjoyed Lily Chatterley's as much as I did Sons and Lovers. I think that's probably going to be, you know, my favourite D.H. Lawrence book, unless The Rainbow and Women in Love can change my mind, and I will definitely be reading those soon. But in any case, it's still an excellent book, and one that is certainly more than its reputation lets on. All right, that's it for my list of the best books that I read this year. Let me know in the comments what great books you read this year. Also, if you have any suggestions for other end-of-year videos that I could make, let me know in the comments. And I'll see you all in the next video. ta -ra.